So Rusty made a video ranking all 308 weapons. A lot of you wanted me to review the tier list, but 308 weapons is a lot and it would be much too large of a video for me to do if I did it all in one go. So over the next however long it takes, I'll be breaking down his video class by class and fixing it and giving you an objective tier list in both PvE and PvP. Additionally, for PvP, I will have several top tiers give their thoughts on it before I finalize the tier list. If you want me to review a certain class next, please leave it down in the comments and I will get to it as soon as I can. Obviously, with the DLC coming up, it's going to take a little bit of time for me to get through all of the classes as there is a lot of weapons. And since I have to formulize and test everything by hand, such as DPS, status damage per second, poise damage per second, it does take a long time and it's a lot of effort. So if you enjoy this video, please subscribe. And if you have any additional questions or comments, leave them down in the comment section and I'll get to it as soon as possible. Everything was ranked with all kinds of different criteria in mind, how fun the movesets are, how effective they are against however many types of enemies, damage, range, consistency, just about everything down to how they look artistically. All weapons were ranked with all different kinds of criteria in mind, how fun the movesets and animations are. So like already that, like in my mind, worst to best means like you're trying to be objective. Like bro, the Cestus and F tier, that's crazy. Anyways, that's just F tier. Like, Cestus is not, like, Cestus are good. They're very good. I did a no-hit run with the Spike Cestus, which are basically the same. The bleed doesn't really come into effect because the bosses die way too quickly. Because they do so much damage. Oh, yeah, and, uh, of course, Alabaster Lord Sword here is, that's crazy, man. <laughs> and D tier. Alabaster Lord Sword is one, is maybe the, it's like top five Charger 2 weapon in the game, probably. Hoslo's pedal whip in S tier? <laughs> I did a run with this thing and it was it was basically trash, man. Like even even for a bleed build, it's not good. The best whip for sure is the Arumi. Which I didn't see where that was, but let's see where the Arumi is. 106 in B tier. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this almost does seem like if you just put every weapon into a randomizer and then shuffled it, like, this is what you'd get, <laughs> basically. And then just put it in, in order that the randomizer came out at. Is it... Yeah, Darkman Greatsword 51. This, this could easily be argued for number one. Number 272, the Forked Greatsword. Whoopee, more farming. Get out your silver foots if you have any left. Saying this is the second shortest greatsword pulls slightly less weight in this weapon category only because all the greatswords seem to be pretty close to each other in length. But what I don't understand is the funky looking greatswords like this usually have a unique heavy attack or something that's slightly different about how it plays. But this sadly ends up being a case of really cool visual design on a weapon that's as useful as a ham sandwich. Number 253, the Bastard Sword. The light weight does very little to help this sword out. The description states that the hefty blade is used for wide swings to fend off crowds, meaning the fancier Banish Knight R1 animations would have probably made more sense here, but fuck that, I guess. I don't know what neuron deficient circus clown slams a bastard sword into the floor like an axe, but if it's heavy enough to match the claymore in weight while managing to be at least a foot shorter in reach, I don't care what your heavy affinity scaling is. Number 242, the Gargoyle's Black Blade. The only armament in the Black Blade arsenal with a unique skill and it doesn't even have the right vision visual effects attached to its hit bullet. The Corpse Wax Cutter has wrongfully had Black Flame effects attached to it since release. To this day, it still hasn't been fixed, and it's starting to make me wonder whether or not there's some obscure sentence of lore out there that actually tells you it's intentional. This is the most solid proof I have on the theory that they were 100% prepared to give the Black Blade Arsenal their own unique skills, but the only reason I can't think of why they didn't make it in is that someone accidentally deleted the files a week before launch. I'm gonna say this man's name was probably Greg because my anger needs to be directed at something. 
Number 220, the Alabaster Lord's Sword. This doesn't look like it was forged from a meteorite. It looks like it was made to block rain. The intelligence requirement is the highest of the three, but it doesn't really do anything that significantly factors into the damage it deals. So am, am I a nutcase for asking why the intelligence requirement is so fucking high to begin with? It's not even that there is one that bothers me. What bothers me is that it's the highest. So anyone picking this up on a first playthrough is going to think it's the most important stat to upgrade, and it's not. Number 208, the Lord Sworn Greatsword. One of two greatswords in the entire game with a crit modifier of 110. You know, for those greatsword wielding ninjas that prefer stealth over using a more conspicuous weapon, like a, like a greatsword or something. It's the one single case I will ever attempt arguing where this should have been a farming weapon that could be looted from soldiers instead. I appreciate the convenience of finding it in a chest, but I, I, I don't know, I think that just sets a bad precedent. Could have used the Banished Knight's R1 moveset, but outside of that, it's really just a semi-decent strength weapon with a noticeable fall off during the mid-game. Number 193, the Gargoyle's Greatsword. This could have been a beautiful weapon, but the waxy tip just makes it look like a troll cleaned the inside of his ear with it and then threw it away. It does make for a pretty efficient strength weapon due to its A scaling on heavy affinity, but flexibility being scarce on gargoyle weapons also means only pure strength builds will be able to unlock this weapon's full potential. It has a shorter reach than most greatswords, but the damage is certainly there. It's got some stopping power, I just wish someone didn't dip it in expired mustard before giving it to us. Number 176, the Iron Greatsword. The fuck is this, Skyrim? This greatsword is, in many ways, the superior choice to the Bastard Sword. However, the mundanity that comes with the chore of farming it from one of the rarest enemy types is more than enough for most people to just flat out not consider it and go for something more easily obtainable like the Knight's Greatsword. A low A scaling on its heavy affinity only handing out 30 to 40 more damage than a heavy Bastard Sword isn't a convincing argument, and even less so when it weighs 12 goddamn pounds. Number 138, the Knight's Greatsword. It's like a, a sword, but, but greater. Wonder what they call those. Bees on quality affinity. Pretty nice. I don't know, man. They're just giant swords. Wave it around enough and people leave you alone. What, you need a tutorial or something? Number 128, the Inseparable Sword. Holy great swords I'm generally not a fan of, but the Inseparable Sword is structured in a way that makes a lot of it tolerable. Its strongest stat scaling is with faith, and being anchored in a single stat makes it much more convenient to build around. It's got the fancy R1s, it comes with a convenient damage bonus against undead enemies like Deathbirds, and Sacred Blade as a skill is a decent one to be stuck with. The holy buff can be triggered very early in the animation, even if you get flinched out of the actual projectile itself, and when investing solely in faith, this greatsword becomes the second strongest option, outmeasured only by the Sacred Affinity Iron Greatsword due to its high base damage. Number 125, the Golden Order Greatsword. If you're a faith-centric build, your hardest decision is likely going to be choosing between this and the Inseparable Sword. And even though this greatsword is a good three or four spots higher on the ladder, I'm still not completely satisfied with the idea of recommending one over the other 100% of the time. This has a slightly higher faith scaling than the inseparable sword, yet loses to it in most cases due to its lack of strength scaling. If you're literally only leveling faith and keeping up your physical stats enough to meet requirements, the total damage output between the two is pretty much identical. But that unique skill is, uh, <laughs> holy shit. Number 93, Death's Poker. More of a frostbite weapon than a magic weapon, especially since the little splinter of elemental damage it has in addition to its physical base kind of functions like a sixth finger. The end scaling gets overshadowed very quickly by strength and dex, leading me to assume the extra 36 just had to be there to consistently represent Ghost Flame as a source of magic damage. Only wait right there, stop chewing on that broom handle and wait just a minute because the unique skill powers up exclusively with intelligence to the point where diminishing returns aren't even that noticeable until you're in the 50s, making the E to D intelligence scaling a very misleading indication of its true strength. Sadly, Death's Poker has always been on the more popular side, so trivializing the whole of PvE with some dude's back scratcher comes with very little bragging rights nowadays. Number 58, the Marais Executioner Sword. The champion of one-shots, the pioneer of talisman boosting, and probably one of the only legendary armaments that actually understands that the word legendary is a goddamn privilege. Despite scaling best with strength, the arcane requirement is still 23, making for a little confusion when the arcane scaling tops out at a D at plus 10. Also a tad embittered by not being able to control the sword slashes with my weird telekinetic magneto powers that I know I have somewhere, but any further complaining I think just takes away from what's already a a pretty great weapon. Number 51, the Dark Moon Greatsword. Nice glow stick, bro. Number 49, the Flamberge. It's named the way it is because the flowing blade gives the impression of a live flame, hence the name Flamberge. 
No, 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 don't, don't fact check that or anything. I, I promise, it's true. Number 45, the Sword of Milos. This great sword comes with so many weird little benefits that it just makes it hard not to ignore. The FP regen on kill gives it a comfortable niche with magic builds or other melee builds that hinge on the use of war ashes, the charged heavies close distance, free bleed buildup, great physical scaling on a plus 10, and the lore strikes a really cozy balance between sad as shit and oh my god I'm beating fuckers with somebody's spine energy. Probably because you're beating fuckers with somebody's spine. Number 40, Ordovis' Greatsword. A wonderful weapon that both feels comfortable and has exceptional scaling at plus 10. The fact that it doesn't hinge on holy damage or faith scaling makes it a great strength weapon, in addition to the unique skill only scaling with the weapon level. Everything seems to line up in a way that looks like it would make the faith scaling irrelevant, but it still gets a capable C scaling at plus 10. The unique skill itself is, is, is just stupid. It's stupid as fuck. It feels so much better to use than it probably deserves, and it stays relevant all the way till the end game, even with its holy damage spread, which is honestly very impressive. Number 37, the Blasphemous Blade. Probably one of the single greatest weapons for anything PvE related, but it also has some setbacks I think most people haven't really considered. Fire damage is nice, yes, we all know this, but that's not taking into account this great sword's mortal enemy. Rain. Fire damage loses 20% of its punching power when the enemy is either in water or being pissed on by the greater will in the form of precipitation. This makes areas like Dragon Barrow and Deep Root decently equipped to push back against builds that use this greatsword. It's still a wonderful main weapon. The base damage is comparable to God Slayer's greatsword, which isn't even in the same fucking class, and the additional heal on hit effect attached to the unique skill means you'll basically never die. Number 34, the Sacred Relic Sword. You can get around 6 million runes per hour if you farm the Albinorix from Mogwin Palace. Great, okay, now that I've got the easy part out of the way, fuck yourself if this is the only reason you use this sword. Do it on camera right now. This is the single great sword for Dex Faith builds. The range is great, you have a crit modifier of 110, the visual design is literally a crucified Radagon with a giant holy needle coming out his ass, and the unique skill is exceptionally powerful against just about everything. Stop genociding innocent frogmen for a few minutes and you'll see what I'm talking about. Number 31, Health in Steeple. A nice, comfortable strength int weapon. S certainly no shortage of those swimming around. But this one is a special case. The buff provided by the unique skill comes out extremely quickly, and it gives you a flat buff of 100 magic damage plus frost buildup. Three or four quick attacks from there is almost always all you ever need to reliably proc frost, and the additional damage means even light attacks can start knocking away absurdly large chunks of enemy health. If you remember to actually use the goddamn skill, the steeple is probably one of the best strength int weapons on the market. Number 28, the Claymore. Even though it gets placed at the median of the greatsword selection in terms of range, it's actually actually slightly higher than the average, and the only reason this diagram is here is because I know hearing too much math terminology leaves some people susceptible to vomiting on themselves. It's not just good, it's consistently good. It's found incredibly early in the game, it's compatible with so many different ashes, and weighing only 9 pounds is an even further testament to its flexibility. This great sword could be a sidearm if you wanted it to. Outside of the obvious lack of research that you could tell Rusty did, the great sword tier list isn't terrible as far as information goes the main problems that I have with it as far as information is blasphemous blade the fire damage from rain and standing in water is not 20% it is 10% equally so if you have both then it would be 20% however if it's not both it's going to be 10% for rain and 10% for water not 20% for each the Ordovos' Greatsword does not scale with weapon level, it is a motion value attack, meaning it will scale with the AR, so with your stats basically. And then Inseparable Sword is not a pure faith weapon, it wants 50 faith and then equal points into dexterity and strength, so it's a quality faith weapon which is a horrible stat spread that very very few weapons actually use. It works fine on pure faith, but you just get so much better AR doing a quality faith build. Of course, you need the points to do that, though. And then the Sacred Relic Sword is a pure dex weapon with a faith requirement, and the skill scales only with faith. So if you want to use the skill, go pure faith. If you want to use the sword, go pure dexterity. It's not a dex faith weapon, there are very few actual dex faith weapons in the game, so keep that in mind. 
Since greatswords are such a large class, I'm not going to go through each individual greatsword's DPS and info about it. Most of them aren't relevant since they're just outclassed by either Flamberge or Iron Greatsword, as far as infusible ones go. So, I'm going to cover the important ones, but I did test all of them. I have it in the Greatsword Dive document in the description. If you're curious about like the heavy attacks, the regular DPS, the Ash of War DPS. The Heavy Iron Greatsword has a DPS of 757. And with Craig Blade, it has a DPS of 871, which is not the meta DPS, but it is still good DPS. Obviously, it is better than whips and such. And it also has decent poise damage per second. The poise damage per second on a regular L1 chain for great swords is going to be 8.004 or 8.8 .8 with Craig Blade. Very decent and usable poise damage per second and all great swords get pretty reasonable dps obviously not the best but reasonable the occult flamberge has a dps of 639 with a status of 170 for a total of 809 now, if you add on Craigblade to that, that's going to be 734, or a total of 905. Flamberge is going to be your default Blood Greatsword for bleed builds, and Iron Greatsword is going to be your default Infusible Greatsword for all other builds. Outside of this, all the other Infusible Greatswords are going to be outclassed, as I've already said. Doesn't mean that you can't use them, it's just not really relevant make a build around them. So Death's Poker, Ash of War, Ghost Flame Ignition. The R1 will get 1,449, which is a meta Ash of War. So this is very, very close to what the DPS of Scavenger's Curve Swords or any standard claw, which is insane. However, the caveat is an enemy has to stand in the tick damage, that little flat field that the Ghost Slam Ignition will shoot out, to get that full DPS. The thing is though, it has a poise damage per second of 11, which is higher than something like Savage's Curve Swords or Claws. And the poise damage per second doesn't rely on standing in that area of effect that flame swath like the regular DPS is. So it still gets decent poise damage per second, even without that. The R2 is not as spectacular. The R2 Ghost Flame Ignition gets 646 DPS and 13 poise damage per second. Dark Moon Greatswords, Moonlight Greatsword Ashwar is really unique because it's a buff Ash of War, but it also provides a unique heavy attack that in other games has functioned as an Ash of War. So Moonlight Greatsword, the on charge attack, gets 1,104 DPS. It gets 52 damage from status. Frostbite isn't really relevant as a status effect for a pure status damage per second. However, because it lowers enemies negations, you can increase your DPS that way. And that's the main factor of Frost. But I didn't calculate that here because that is really relevant for this comparison. Because you can just throw a Frost Pot at an enemy instead. And the poise damage per second is 15.6. So pretty high for a Greatsword. Even with the Godfrey Icon and Shard of Alexander, the charge attack just doesn't hold up to the on charge attack. As I've said, that's kind of a theme. It on charged is just going to be better in most cases. But charge DPS of 997 or a total DPS of 1049. Golden Order Greatsword uh, Establish Order Ashivor is interesting because it's kind of slept on. You can loop it, which is interesting. It doesn't get high DPS looping it, but you can do. Pretty good poise damage per second, doing 21.8. But Establish Order itself does 1,040 
DPS, which is pretty good. Obviously on that tier of like a Moonlight Greatsword charged attack. Now the Alabaster Lord Greatsword is an oddity because it sucks if you're just looking at it from a AR or a scaling standpoint. However, it has very good heavy attacks. The heavy attacks are what you want to use though. They have a increased motion value on the heavy attacks and they have super low stamina consumption. So most great swords have a stamina consumption of 44 on the charge attacks. However, the Alabaster Lord Sword has a stamina cost of 18. And on the Arn Charge attack, it's a stamina cost of 9. That is so low compared to the other great swords that combined with the high motion value, you can just keep attacking uh, charge attacks without ever running out of stamina. It's super good. Now, for the high motion value, let me show you the DPS. On charge, you're gonna have a DPS of 844, or a poison damage per second of 13. But with the charged DPS, including the Axe Talisman and the Spiked Cracked tier, you're gonna have a DPS of 923 and a poise damage of 16.9. Now to put that into perspective, the Occult Flamberge, which has the highest DPS of the regular greatswords, has a charge DPS of 789 when factoring status. So that's almost 100 extra DPS you're getting on a somber weapon with a very low stamina cost. The Gargoyles Black Blade Corpse Wax Cutter, Corpse Wax Cutter, Ash of War is the holy version of the Taker's Flames, except for it has health sapping. So the DPS does depend on the enemy's max health. Obviously, since I'm calculating the average max health, it's only around 2,000. On bosses, it's gonna do a lot more DPS. But it still gets a respectable DPS of 866, even without factoring in bosses' health. And a poise damage per second of 14.6, which isn't bad. Ordovus's Greatsword, Ordovus's Vortex, Ash of War, is not very good for DPS only having 750 uncharged and 732 charged. It's still respectable, but it's low compared to the other options. So you're probably wondering why I have it listed here. Well, it has pretty absurd poise damage per second. It has 19.4 on the uncharged, whatever, most great swords can kind of get close to that. But charged, it has a poise damage per second of 35.9. That is absurd. Health in Steeple is interesting because without its Ash of War, it gets middling DPS, 687. However, with the Ash of War Ruinous Ghost Flame, it's 800 DPS just right off the bat, using it on a regular L1 chain. And with status, it's Frostbite, so it's not really that much D uh, DPS from status, but it's 66 DPS from status. For a total of 867. But again, it can proc frost like the Dark Moon Greatsword. I didn't include it because again you can just throw a frost pot. But if you do proc frost, it will lower the enemy's damage negation, causing you to have a higher DPS than on what I've listed here. The last weapon I want to go into depth with the DPS about is the Blasphemous Blade and the Ash of War Taker's Flames. It has meh DPS, it's 600, 590 DPS, with a poise damage per second of 22. However, it does regen your health. I'll get into it a little bit more later, but I don't think that is a good trade-off, good enough trade-off for some of the other options on the list. The following discussion will be a brief summary of the Great Swords. I'm not going to include the Great Swords that are outclassed by either Iron Great Sword or Flamberge, since that would that would add a lot of extra information that just isn't that relevant. 
If you want an infusible greatsword, use iron greatsword. And if you want a bleed greatsword, use flame purge. I've kind of already covered that in the DPS section, but that's the most important takeaway for the infusible greatswords. Iron greatsword can be farmed in Lindell or the Halig Tree, which is unfortunate. However, it's the best infusible greatsword in terms of stat efficiency, damage per hit, and damage per second. But it's on the heavy side, weighing 12 pounds, and it has an average range on the greatswords. Flame Burge can be found in Raidband Castle and works well with Craigblade or Bloody Slash on the Cold Affinity. It's a longer greatsword and offers the best DPS when factoring in status. Death's Poker is dropped from the Kayla Deathbird, and it offers the highest DPS from a greatsword if you can land the ticks from the Light Ash of War. Given it can be grabbed early and doesn't need high int to scale well, you can use it for an entire playthrough without difficulty. Now, Rusty did mention this. Yes, the Death's Poker is more of a strength dex weapon, favoring dex than it is an int weapon, but the greatsword Ash of War does scale primarily off of int. You do have some motion values on there, but for the most part, it's going to be attack magic. I calculated the Death's Poker with low intelligence, fact favoring the regular attack damage. Even with low int, I was able to push impressive numbers, and int scales well up to 50 for magic damage. You can go past that, it does take a drop after 50 though. It's a very efficient weapon to get high DPS. With claws or with curved swords, you do need to invest into like 80 to get really good stat returns and DPS. But with Dust Poker, that's really not necessary. 50 is enough to have meta DPS. Dark Moon Greatsword is found after finishing Ronnie's questline, which is near the end of the game. It offers good poise damage per second as well as good regular damage per second at range, which is why it's rated so highly. Golden Order Greatsword is the faith version of Dark Moon Greatsword. It offers good poise damage per second and DPS at slightly less range, which is why it is rated so highly. It is found in the Cave of the Forlorn. As I explained earlier, the Alabaster Lord Sword has higher motion values on its charge and arm charge type attacks, and a much lower stamina consumption, leading it to have much higher DPS than its brethren. It doesn't need high strength to have good TPS, and it's and is most rune level one challenge runners' weapon of choice. That being said, it still scales well enough to be used on a level build, and can compete with the best great swords at the cost of some poise damage per second. It's dropped after you kill the Alabaster Lord in the Lake of Rot, so as soon as you get to Radon, you can kind of push towards that. Gargoyle's Black Blade is essentially the holy damage version of Blasphemous Blade that sacrifices the HP regen for the Black Blade HP stepping effect. Due to this though, the DPS against bosses is higher than what I calculated here as I was calculating against the average health of the across the entirety of PvE. It is dropped by Black Blade Kindred at the Bestial Sanctum, which you can fight early game, but it's intended to be late game. Ordovis' Greatsword has absurd poise damage per second with its weapon cell, and its DPS isn't half bad outside of that either, assume you're going for like charge attacks or an L1 chain. It is dropped by the Crucible Duo Fight, Health in Steeple, as I said, has very high DPS when buffed with its weapon skill, but it's found in Castle Soul, which is late game. The Sword of Milos is dropped by the Dung Eater. It has Armor Shred, a roar that increases strength by 5 and damage by 7.5%, and it has FP regen on kill. On top of that, it has good DPS for a Greatsword as well as a Touch of Bleed. Armor Shred, I did not calculate when factoring the DPS in, so the DPS, if you use the Ash of War, is going to be higher than what I showcased here. Blasphemous Blade is obviously found by using Ricard's Remembrance. It has poor DPS, but has heal and hit with its Ash of War, and depending on how highly you rank health regen, it can be the best greatsword because of that. I personally don't rank health regen that high, so it's going to be lower in my tier list, it's a very subjective placement for Blasphemous Blade, just because of that health regen. 
Mariah's Executioner Sword is really good on one-shot setups, being able to kill a new game plus Melania when you stack lots of DPS, but the DPS on it is really bad due to the recovery time. It can be found in the Shaded Castle and needs a good bit of strength and arcane investment to really make it hit hard. Sacred Relic Sword is found after trading the Elden Beast Remembrance at the end of the game. It offers middling DPS, but the weapon skill can yield around 6 million runes per hour with the Golden Scarab Talisman at Bogwin Palace. And that's really the most relevant part about the weapon, is its farming capabilities. As I said, it's pure dex, unless you're going for the weapon skill, which it's pure faith then. And it's found at the very end of the game, so you basically don't get to use it unless you're going into New Game Plus. Inseparable Sword has a locked Ash of War and a bad stat spread, as I said, being quality faith. But it can get some good DPS even if it is split holy. It can be found early in Limgrave if you kill a D, or after you give the other D D's armor. It also deals 20% damage to undead and prevents skeletons from responding if you care about that. I don't. I didn't include that in my PvE tier list at all because it's honestly so irrelevant that it's probably never going to come up unless you're fighting deathbirds or going through catacombs. Speaking of that tier list, here it is. Now I know a lot of you might be mad because I ranked Blasphemous Blade so low. I feel like I've kind of covered that base already, so I'm just going to get to it when I get to it. In S tier, obviously we have Death's Poker. Having the highest DPS of any great sword and having better DPS at that is really impressive. Then I have the Darkmoon Great Sword. While yes, it's kind of hard to get, it offers good damage per second and poise damage per second at range, and not a lot of great swords can do that. Then I have the Golden Order Great Sword. Same thing, but a holy version that seals with faith and has slightly less range. Then I have the Flamberge. It technically has good DPS on status, and outside of that, you can infuse it with Ashes of War, which makes it more versatile than any other somber greatsword. Then I have the Alabaster Lord Sword because of those charged R2s, just super good, super high DPS, high poise damage per second, high hyper armor, too. Very, very efficient weapon. Then in A tier, I have the Iron Greatsword, the best infusible greatsword for non-bleed builds. Doesn't have as much DPS as Flamberge when you're factoring status, so that's why it's a little bit lower. Then I have the Gargoyle's Black Blade. Obviously, it is a subjective placement too, depending on what kind of enemy you're fighting and how high the HP is, the DPS can fluctuate kind of wildly. Similar to the Blasphemous Blade, it has a similar animation and you're trading HP sapping for HP regen, as I've said. Then I have the Ordovis' Greatsword. Love that Ash of War. That Ash of War does insane poise damage per second and its scaling with AR is a really good thing because I believe it favors a strength build for the most part. You might have to double check me on that. I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. I've calculated it all days ago, so can't remember. But yes, it's very efficient. Um, being able to dish out high damage basically the entire game. Then I have Health and Steeple. Really impressive damage when buffed. That's really all there is to it. I have Sword of Milos here, which is another controversial ranking. You could probably put it in B tier. But I feel like the Armor Shred, combined with the uh, Roar, makes it pretty good for poise trading and being able to just kind of tank through boss attacks and still put up good DPS. Then in B tier, leading B tier are the Blasphemous Blade, because low DPS, I don't feel like the health regen makes up for that. Mariah's Executioner Sword, it's okay. As I said, the DPS isn't great because of the long recovery time, but it serves well in one-shot builds. Then I have the Sacred Relic Sword. If you're just known for farming, 
and you're not actually a good weapon, I don't see the point in having you be any higher. The B tier is kind of meh, but they all have niches where they can be good. And then the C tier is all infusible greatswords that are just outclassed. I have the Forked Greatsword, obviously just outclassed by the Flamberge. Then I have the Gargoyle's Greatsword. It's an infusible greatsword that's strength scaling primarily, but it loses out to the Iron Greatsword. And... Yeah, that's all it is. Banished Knight's Greatsword, same deal. It is a strength scaling greatsword that loses out to the Iron Greatsword. However, it has a unique moveset, so there's that. Master Sword is also the same thing. It's a strength scaling greatsword that loses out to the Iron Greatsword. I don't know why FromSoft keeps doing this, just making regular weapons just completely outclassed by each other. I don't get it. Like, why even include the weapon in the first place then? Or why make it droppable and just have it be an enemy only weapon? In D tier, we have the Claymore. Thrusting attacks are not enough to save the Claymore. It is another strength scaling greatsword, but it has lower DPS than the others that I've already mentioned. It has thrusting attacks though, so maybe if you can always land counter attacks, it can be a little bit better, but still not that viable. Then I have the Inseparable Sword, the lowest somber weapon. It's basically regular weapon, but you can't change the ass of war, and it's your stuck with Sacred Blade. Being a quality faith split is horrible for it. It really hurts its performance. Even without that, it gets low DPS, so it's kind of hard to feel bad for it, I guess. Then I have the Lord Sword and Great Sword. 110 crit is irrelevant because. You just swap to Mystery Cord if you're going to go for crits. Sacrificing your DPS is not worth it. On the plus side though, it is one of the few greatswords to actually scale better with Faith when infused than Heavy. So it has a niche. Its niche just sucks. <laughs> then I have the Knight's Greatsword. It's like the Banished Knight Greatsword, but it sacrifices damage for range, which in PvE is pretty irrelevant. And it also is better with flame art, which is kind of weird. But it's outclassed by Lord Sorn, which is outclassed by iron, so there's really no point in using it. The PvP viability of great swords are pretty good because they're decently fast, long range weapons in Elder Ring, and overall as a class their position is C tier. Knight's Greatsword, Banished Knight's Greatsword, and Dark Moon Greatsword are in B- tier for the following reasons. Knight's Greatsword has the best movements, move set and range. Range and speed is very important, and being able to true combo attacks is also pretty important in a game that doesn't have many true combos. Banished Knight's Greatsword has the best move set, but sacrifices range for damage. Knight's Greatsword is better than it. Banished Knight is a pretty close second though. Dark Moon Greatsword has more poise damage on the one hand R1, 2, than other Greatswords. It also doesn't have stamina consumption on that one attack, which is very strange, I don't know why. But it's bugged, and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon, so there you go, better than the others. Claymore has a unique thrusting crouch attack and heavy attacks that make it worth considering other options not listed here. It's really, it's not that good compared to Dark Moon, Banished, or Knights, though. Flamberge is good for Arcane with Bloody Slash and a Nicole offhand Wakizashi. Inseparable has the best moveset, but ran bad range and a horrible stat spread. Again, quality of faith, horrible stat spread. Do not want it. A Sacred Relic Sword is the longest great sword, and on a pure dex build, it can be pretty funny with Wakazashi. Not as good as Darkmoon Greatsword or Flamberge though, but you can do some funny stuff with it. The rest really aren't worth using. 
Forked, Cordovos, and Steeple are good options as well due to their mix-ups and damage potential. But they all suffer from the Greatsword nerf. Bless Steeple's heart. I personally prefer Flamberge over Forked as they share the same niche, but Flamberge is longer with more AR and bleed. However, Forked has some unique R2 mix-ups that Flamberge no longer has. And for the PvP tier list, in S tier I have the Knight's Greatsword, the Banished Knight's Greatsword, and the Dark Moon Greatsword, to no one's surprise. Those are the best greatswords. You probably shouldn't use anything else. However, in A tier, I do have the Insufferable Greatsword, the Flamberge, Claymore, Ordovus' Greatsword, and Helfin Steeple. Steeple gets some nutty AR, and although it no longer has its nice R2, it's still pretty good. In B tier, I have the Sacred Relic Sword. As I've already mentioned, it's pretty good with an offhand walkie. Blasphemous Blade is long enough range. The Ashivore is pretty bad, but it's decent range. The Golden Order Greatsword is... It's, it's a thing. It's long range. And Sword of Milos is also long range. As you'll notice from here on out, it's basically just... If it's longer range than the other greatswords, it's going to be a ranked higher. Because there's not much difference between them, they're all kind of bad. In C tier, I have the Iron Greatsword. Which is longer than the Mariah's Executioner Sword. Which is longer than the Death Spoker. Which is longer than the Lord Sword Greatsword. I think if they made Lord Sword Greatsword more of a Claymore with the Poke, it could actually be a little bit better, since it does have that higher crit, it could maybe do some funny stuff with it. But they just didn't, so it's mid. Then in D tier, I have the Bastard Sword, which is longer than the Gargoyle's bla uh, Black Blade and regular Gargoyle Sword, which is longer than the Fork Great Sword, which is longer than the Alabaster Great Sword. Again, I don't know why FromSoft continues to make weapons that just directly outclass each other. Because it basically means you don't need to use the other weapon. But that's it. So thank you guys for watching, and be sure to comment the next class that you want me to cover.